أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا كنت فيهم فأقمت لهم الصلاة فلتقم طائفة منهم معك وليأخذوا وليأخذوا أسلحتهم فإذا سجدوا فليكونوا من ورائكم ولتأتي طائفة أخرى لم يصلوا فليصلوا معك وليأخذوا وليأخذوا حذرهم وأسلحتهم ود الذين كفروا لو تغفلون عن أسلحتكم وأمتعتكم فيميلون عليكم ميلة واحدة ولا جناح عليكم من كان بكم أذى من مطر أو كنتم مرضى أن تضعوا أسلحتكم وخذوا حذركم إن الله أعد للكافرين عذابا مهينا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Last week we did um Ayah number 101 وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقُصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَةِ This ayah, we spent the entire class doing it and it was complicated and the summary of it that one of the meanings is that if you travel then there is no harm on you if you shorten the prayers and another meaning of it is that if you are traveling during war and you face the enemy and you fear that they may attack you, then you do the prayer of khawf. We took in detail the rulings with regards to prayer during travel and the shortening of the prayer and its detailed rulings around how long you have to travel before you can do qasr what, which prayers involve the qasr when you get to a destination how many days can you stay before you have to complete the prayer all these detailed rulings alhamdulillah we completed one of the brothers asked a question that if I'm staying with my parents then will I do qasr or not and I want to clarify that I made a uh, mistake with regards to that and part of it is that this is something that is famous in our country but when you go back to the books the books actually state the same ruling regardless of whether you are staying with your parents or not but understand this because someone asked what is the ruling in Imam Shafi so I looked at the rulings for both Imam Hanifa, Imam Shafi and also Imam Malik and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal they all by and large have the same ruling so just understand this before we go on to today's ayah which is a person has a watan asli and a watan al-iqamah. The watan asli is the place that you are staying in as your permanent residence. The permanent residence is defined in two or three different ways. Okay? And the easiest way to look at this is, this is the place that you are spending, where your house is, where your belongings are, where you yourself consider that you stay there long term or permanently. So all of you brothers, it will be Sydney. The Hanafis actually describe it as the place where the person has married and is staying with his wife. They don't define it according to the parents, they actually def define it according to the wife. So for example, a person was born in Damascus and he married and he went to Hams. And then he now he is living in Hams with his wife then his watan and asli is no longer Damascus, it now becomes Hams because that's where he lives with his wife. It's not his place of birth or his place where his parents are. This is the same position for the uh, Shafis and the others, but it is with regards to where you are living permanently. Now, so you have moved from wherever you used to live in Beirut or Kenya or Pakistan or India and now you live in Sydney and now you went back to visit your parents in your homeland, will you do qasr there or not? That homeland place will now be considered watan al-iqamah. So if, according to the Hanafis, if you stay less than 15 days, you will do qasr there. Okay? 
And according to everyone else, if you stay for less than four days, <coughs> then you will do qasr. As long as it is above four days, then you will do complete prayers. So let's now take the example of a Shafi. He goes back to, give me an example of a country where the Shafi is. He goes to Malaysia, okay? And uh, he goes to Kuala Lumpur, he visits his parents, and he stays there for five days. Now he will pray complete prayers. And if it is so that he is staying less than that, so he stays for three days, then he will do Qasr, even though he is staying in Kuala Lumpur, he is not physically traveling anywhere. Okay? Is this example now clear of what you are supposed to do? So from the travel from here to Sydney, everyone agrees that you have to leave the boundary of the city before you can do Qasr based on the action of the Prophet So that when you are within the city, I'm intending that I will travel today, but I haven't left the city yet, then I will pray complete prayers. As I left the city bounds and I'm intending to travel to Kuala Lumpur, which is longer than the distance required for Qasr, then I will do Qasr on the way. I stayed in Kuala Lumpur for a conference and I stayed there for three days. I will continue to do Qasr even though I am staying in one place. I'm not physically traveling. And then on the way back, I will continue to do Qasr. And as soon as I landed in Sydney, within the bounds of Sydney, now I will have to do a complete prayer. So uh, I wanted to apologize for the mistake I gave in terms of the information, but the clarification is that even if you are going to your parents' house or your wife's parents' house, that place will be treated as a place of iqama rather than a watan al-asli. I will take questions, so I know I haven't started my tafsir yet. He was before you. Yeah. Um, isn't there a period in uh, the day you enter and uh, the day you leave you can do khasr? No, the, the day itself does not count. Okay, like you're counting the number of days of traveling. No, the, the, the mas'ala with, is with regards to when you leave the boundaries of the place. According to everyone, this is ijma' in this mas'ala. Yes. What, what, what is your specific question about that? The combination of the prayers, right. doing traveling, yes? They have to be qasr, right? Because now you are traveling, so you will be doing qasr, right? Yeah. Imam al-Shafi gives, makes the qasr as a sunnah, means he makes it optional, right? And we mentioned this last week, most of you brothers missed last week because of the t ch timing change. But we said that Imam Shafi makes the Qasr optional, Imam Abu Hanifa makes the Qasr wajib. He says the Qasr is azima. And Imam Shafi says the Qasr is ruhsa, meaning it is optional. So if a person is combining the prayers, then uh, to follow the Sunnah, he should do Qasr and he will do Jama' according to Imam Shafi. We also mentioned last week that Imam Abu Hanifa does not have Jama' bain al salatain in any situation except in Arafat behind the Imam that he will join Zuhr and Asr behind the Imam and in Muzdalifa he will join Maghrib and Isha apart from these two situations he does not have jam in any situation regardless of rain or khawf or anything else okay but all the other three they have joining in travel and they have joining in rain okay and they have different criteria for the joining in rain. Can we can we stick to the questions about travel rather than the joining? Because the travel. Okay. Uh, if I'm going back to my country, yeah. I'm intending to stay more than a month. So what I understand is the first three days or four days, I'm doing Qasr. No. Now you have intended to stay for a month. The first three days will be prayed just as the remainder of the month, okay? It is when I am intending to stay three days, okay? Then I will do Qasr for those three days. As soon as I intended to stay there for a month, the allowance of Qasr is gone. Okay? Good question. Before Isha, you do Qasr. 
Both are allowed. Jama'a taqdeem wa ta'akhir are both allowed in the Shafi madhab. You must always pray the Maghrib before the Isha. If you pray the Isha before the Maghrib, the Isha becomes invalidated. And then the Maghrib will become valid. Okay, and then the Isha will not count for anything. And then you will have to repeat the Isha after the Maghrib. There is no way to pray the orders, the, the, the prayers without their order. They have to be prayed in order. The Prophet ﷺ will come to the tafsir of the ayah today. Is that during the battle of the Ahzab, he missed four prayers. So he missed four prayers. And we, when he made them up, he made them up in order. Okay. If you keep coming to the uh, fiqh sessions, we will cover the uh, prayer of travel again. And we will do the combining of the prayers in detail, all the rulings regarding to that. And we will also do how to pray the missed prayers. And then um, if you want to know further, you can listen to the class last week from the um, video. Let's move on, inshallah. What is the fasting? The fasting is unrelated to the prayer. We said before that the fasting is unrelated to Janaba. Janaba, it has its relationship to the prayer and to the recitation of the Quran and to entering the masjid. It is irrelevant to the fasting. A person can be, he can be in the state of Janaba the entire day from Fajr to Maghrib and his fasting will be valid. Now you imagine this prayer has not, this person has not prayed, okay? But his fasting will still be valid because the fasting it does not have a relationship to the prayer. Similarly, a person may not pray the whole year round and he gives his zakah every year. All right? His zakah will in itself be valid. Okay? Uh, so the hajj is connected to the prayer. Okay? Um, there are details there I don't want to go into, but anyway, but the fasting is unrelated to the prayer. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ أَنْ يَقْتُلَ مُؤْمِنٍ Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a uh, battle with the Kuffar and the Kuffar were seeing them. They had not started the battle. And Khalid bin al-Walid was amongst the Kuffar and they started to pray al-Dhuhr. So they started to talk to each other and you know, they were saying, should we go, should we not go? You know, what's our strategy? And in this kind of discussion, they had completed their prayer. So they lost their opportunity. So one of them said that don't worry, there is a prayer coming that is more beloved to them than the one that they just prayed. That meaning Asr prayer is coming that is more beloved to them than Dhuhr prayer in which there is an evidence that perhaps Salat al-Asr is Salat al-Wusta. Okay, and there are other evidences for all the other four prayers, but this is one of the hadith that is brought forth in the evidence for Salat al-Asr. Then this ayah was revealed and the Prophet wasallam prayed the Asr prayer with the method of Salat al-Khawf. Okay. So I will now detail how Salat al-Khawf is prayer, but before I go into it, understand that the Fuqaha describes 16 different forms of this prayer. I'm just going to describe three of them. It gets a bit confusing, so you are allowed to ask questions. Once I describe them, then I will also describe where the place of this is. One of the methods is, so the, in all of these methods, the Imam is dividing the party into two parties. Okay, he starts the prayer and half the people pray with him and half the people stand guard. The first group will pray one raka'ah with the imam. They will do sujood, they will do ruku'ah, they will do sujood. The imam gets up for his second raka'ah and he stands. 
the people that are behind him go on to complete the second rak'ah even though the imam is still standing. So they go on to complete their own prayer. They do salam and they go away. They go and stand guard and the party that was standing guard before will now come and start praying behind the imam who is in his second rak'ah and now they are in his their first rak'ah. They, he completes the prayer and he stays in tashahud. He stays sitting there. They get up and they pray their second rak'ah and they come down and when they come to do their tashahud and then the imam does taslim and they do taslim with him. Okay? In this manner, everyone prayed with the imam. <coughs> they all prayed two rak'ah and the imam also prayed two rak'ah. Was that confusing or did you understand it? It was very confusing. <laughs> okay. It's explaining how a jazi like recites. Yeah, he's reciting, but so they are praying their own prayer. But after they, they, they see the smoke behind them, they leave. They leave. The and second group comes. The imam, still the, si the imam is still reciting. So he lengthens his standing. Yeah. Okay. So he's lengthening his standing and he's lengthening his tashahud, his last tashahud. Yes, yeah. you got it? The second mode of praying is similar to the first one in that the imam prays the first rak'ah, the, the first group comes, they pray one rak'ah with him, the imam stands up for the second rak'ah, this group goes on to finish their second rak'ah whilst the imam is standing, just like the first method. They go salam and they go away and then the second group comes and now they stand with the imam in his second rak'ah, the imam goes on to complete he does salam. The second group now has one rak'ah left. They get up and they pray one rak'ah that was left for them. Okay? These are the two methods that Imam Malik and Imam Shafi have. Imam Abu Hanifa has a complicated method. Of course, he had to be hard. So he gets up, the Imam gets up to lead the prayer. And half the group come and pray one rak'ah with him. When he finishes the one rak'ah, they sit and they do salam and they leave. Only one rak'ah. The group that was guarding before will now come and pray behind the imam. And they will pray him with him one rak'ah. The imam now does salam. They get up and they complete their second rak'ah. And the first group that only did one rak'ah now prays, comes and they also pray their remaining one rak'ah. So they were, they prayed first and they left and then they come back again to do their second rak'ah. Now, you can imagine that they were praying, then they left their positions to go towards guarding and then they came back to the prayer again. Did they do any walking? Yes. All right, so they are in effect within their own prayer in the middle of it walking. <coughs> All right, and in effect, the first group were guarding before, and then they go and then they, they pray their first rak'ah with the Imam, and they have missed a rak'ah. There are these are three forms, there are 13 other forms. Each of the fuqaha have selected one and said that this is the most correct. But when they go on and do this discussion, they come at the end and say that the Prophet ﷺ prayed all these prayers and a person can pray any one of them. They will be all correct, but each madhab has selected one to say that this is the most correct. But so in effect, it is like where do you put your hands in prayer? Whether you put it below the belly button, above the belly button, the Prophet ﷺ did both things and both will be considered according to the sunnah. So they give you a choice in which one you want to do. But each one also argues their position. Now, before I go and do the tafsir of this uh, ayah, there are three different conditions. One is where a person is in actual combat. He is actually fighting. Now, forget about war today. Because kids right now, they play you know, video games and they watch people shooting each other with rifles, right? And they think that's what real war is. But real war is not like that. <coughs> but forget about what it is like that. And imagine what they used to do at the time of the Prophet is that they would be 
on the ground with swords fighting each other. Now, can, do you think you can pray in that kind of situation? No. There's a second kind of situation where war has happened, but for the moment it has stopped for a few hours. People are taking a break before they start fighting again. Because you don't fight 24 hours. There's break strategies, movements here and there. <coughs> and the third is where you meet, but war has not yet started. And that meeting could happen for hours or days. And they can attack any time. And the likeness of this, if you take a fort and an army has come to attack the fort and now they are camped outside waiting for the perfect time to attack. Now the people who are in the fort have to guard their fort, right? And at the same time, they don't want to start praying and then find that, okay, whilst we are praying, they are all attacking us. Then during this situation, there are two different kinds of situations the Prophet ﷺ saw himself. One is where the Qibla is this way and the enemy is towards the back. And the other is where the Qibla is this way and the enemy is towards you as well. When the enemy is in front of you and the Qibla is that way, that's much easier. Because whilst you are praying, you can look at the enemy as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if they are near your back and you all started to pray, then there's a problem. <laughs> Correct. Now, in modern warfare, these issues don't really apply. Why is that? Because you're in bunkers, you're in tanks, you're in airplanes, you're in kind of uh, army bases. There's not a situation of archers and swords. This is with missiles, you are guarding using radars and you know technology, different kinds of laws apply. But let me tell you, if there's a tank, how many people are inside a tank? Three, right? There's not usually more than that. So if all three of them started to pray together, what do you think will happen to the tank? It will get destroyed in a few minutes, right? Because no one's looking at the controls, no one's looking at what's happening outside. So if they all wanted to pray together, then what will happen? One will have to stand guard whilst two pray. And then they will use the method of Salat al-Khawf if they wanted to do Jama'ah. Let's go through this ayah and then we'll come through some of the benefits that we can come to. When you come to some of these ayat, you think, well, this is never going to happen in my life, so why should I study this and what will be the benefit? Well, the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah as an ayah of the Qur'an. Therefore, there are other benefits for us. This ayah is actually one of the strongest ayat with regards to the benefit of jama'at. If you think about it for a second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said that half of you pray with one imam, let them finish their prayer, and then half of you pray with another imam. Right? But he said, no, the benefit of the jama'ah is so great that Allah has revealed a kind of prayer which allows everyone to pray behind one imam and get the reward of praying behind one imam. Then there's another point to be made here that Imam Abu Yusuf made. Qadi Abu Yusuf said that this ayah was revealed for the Prophet ﷺ and is not relevant for anyone after him. The whole ummah disagreed with him, right? But he has a point in a way. Why is that? Because the Imam, who is he the Imam? The Imam is the Prophet ﷺ. The reward of praying behind him would be much greater than someone else. So for example, Let's say there is another Sahabi who can be an Imam. Everyone will say, I want to pray behind the Prophet <laughs> So no one will be happy to stand guard while the other groups pray behind the Prophet So in a way, this was the Fadilah of the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a way to do it. Many of the Mufassirun say that this Salat al-Khawf is for the situation where everyone wants to pray behind one Imam. And if there are two prayers, then you will not do Salat al-Khawf. One group will pray behind the Imam, they will complete their prayer. The first group will wait until that group finishes. When they finish, then they will go and do a second Jama'ah. And practically in our times, that's how you will do it. Because an army is not, you know, an army of 10 people or 20 people. It's 100,000, 500,000. They are in different places, you know, different battalions. So they will pray 
according to their numbers and their situation. Let's do the ayah word by word, inshallah. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ If you are with them, فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةَ فَأَقَمْتَ That you will stand up the prayer. Now this has an interesting benefit here. All of the Mufassirun say is that this means that you are their Imam. Imam al-Shafi'i says that the Mu'addin has a fadila over the Imam. Based on the evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussilat, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينَ مِنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ And who is better in the deen than the one who has called to Allah. Imam Abu Hanifa says that the Imam is better than the Mu'addin. But they also both agree that the Iqama is the superior thing to give. They also allow the Imam himself to give the Iqama. So sometimes you go to some masajid and there's no Mu'addin. So the Imam gives the Adhan, he also gives the Iqama and he starts leading. This is allowed. In the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, we don't find that he gave the Iqama himself. He always had a Mu'addin appointed to do that action. So here, فَأَقَنْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةَ is a nickname that you are leading the prayer rather than, it, rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that he is doing the iqama. فَلْتَكُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكَ Then a group will stand from them with you. وَلْيَأْخُذُوا أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ They should take their weapons. Now why should they take their weapons? It's a situation of war. The enemy can attack in any minute. They are actually doing deception. If all of you stand in rows carrying a rifle, what will the enemy think now? They are about to attack us. This is not a good time to attack them, right? And the Imam can stay standing. It's only when they go into ruku and sujood that you realize, okay, they're not actually about to attack us. They're actually praying. Now we said the other time that holding the hands is not a faridah or a wajib. And in fact, Imam Malik has in his madhab, if you come into the fiqh classes, you will learn this as well, that when he says Allahu Akbar, for him the recommended action is that the person puts his hands by the sides. Right? So you see some Malikis when they are praying, they say Allahu Akbar, they put their hands by the sides. So it is allowable that a person when he prays and he wants to deceive the enemy, that he puts his hand by his side holding his rifle or his sword or whatever his weapon is to show that he is ready. So he is not praying in a form that is leaving his provisions. What is the benefit of this? This is a proof that Islam requires us to take our asbab, then do tawakkul. That a person doesn't do tawakkul first and then take the asbab, no. He takes the asbab first and then does tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا سَجَدُوا When they do sajda, فَلْيَكُونُوا مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ They should go behind. Ibn Atiyah, who is probably one of the greatest gram grammatical mufassirun, so there are different kinds of mufassirun, right? I've described this to you before already, you should know this. The top three grammatical tafasir Number one is al zamakhshari who wrote Al-Kashaf. You can make these notes as well, right? Al-Kashaf was written by al zamakhshari Number two is Ibn Atiyah. Okay. Number three is Abu Hayyan al-Andalusi who wrote Al-Bahri al-Muhiyyat. These are the historically the three greatest mufassilun by grammar. In modern times, sorry, Number two was Ibn Atiyah. In modern times, in the last hundred years, you have Ruh al Ma'ani, right? Written by Al Alusi, Al Baghdadi. He is known by Al Alusi. And you have Ibn Ashur. So if you want to say top five tafasir by grammar, these are the top five. Ibn Atiyah said, 
that this means min فَلْيَكُونُ min وَرَائِكُمْ contains meaning for either group. فَلْيَكُونُ min وَرَائِكُمْ can mean that the first group that has prayed should go behind. It can also mean that the group that has not prayed yet will go behind the imam. Yeah, so either. So really, both forms of the prayer are contained within the ayah. فَلْيَكُونُ مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ Is any is there any situation? I'm no, this is all from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yeah, the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is directing it to the Prophet and the Sahaba. Okay. فَلْيَكُونُ مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ وَلْتَأْتِي طَائِفَةٌ أُخْرَى Then another طائفة should come. The second group. لَمْ يُصَلُّوا They have not prayed yet. فَلْيُصَلُّوا مَعَكَ They will pray with you. وَلْيَأْخُذُوا حِذَرَهُمْ وَأَسْلِحَتُهُمْ They should take their weapons and their defenses. <coughs> so, they will just not just take their rifles, they will also take their armor and their shield or whatever else is involved in protecting themselves. وَدَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ تَغْفُلُونَ عَنْ أَسْلِحَتِكُمْ That the people who disbelieve would love that when you have ghafla, you are not heeding your weapons and your uh, things, your belongings, that they should come and attack you a single attack, an attack that will wipe you out. Okay? وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِنْ كَانَ بِكُمْ أَذَمْ مِنْ مَطَرٍ And there is no harm on you that if there is rain, so there is difficulty because of the rain, or that you are sick, that you put down your weapons. Abdul Rahman bin Auf had gone on with an expedition with the Prophet ﷺ, and he became sick during the journey, such that he felt weak holding his weapon. So you imagine now he is a soldier in the army, عنه, but he is sick and he is unable to hold his weapon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is no harm on you to put down your weapons in this kind of situation. Imam al-Shafi based this and said that the holding of the weapons is wajib during the prayer of khawf. The other said that the holding of the weapons is mustahab, meaning it is recommended, it is a sunnah, but not compulsory. I described this in the khutbah last week, whoever attended it will remember, that the amr has 16 different meanings to it. Fi'l amr has 16 different meanings to it. I'm not teaching you that. But just to show you that in the Arabic language, that if I instruct you to do something, that it can have 16 different possibilities. One of those can mean you have to do it, and one of those is that you are recommended to do it. So Imam al-Shafi says, حِذْرَكُمْ وَأَسْلِحَتَكُمْ is wujub, and Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa said that it is istihbab, it is recommended. So both can be possible. وَخُذُوا حِذْرَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَدَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has verily prepared for the kuffar a uh, disgraceful, embarrassing punishment. Why, ha why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finished the ayah with this? He is telling the believers to defend yourself, to be wary, to be careful. So perhaps someone might think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to help the disbelievers. And Allah says, no. Allah is telling you, instructing you how to fight, how to prepare for fight. But he also says that the ending is for you. The ending is not for the kafir. If for whatever reason, if for your deficiency or that because they are strong or that because you made a mistake they defeat you or you are you are killed don't think that they are superior in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the reality is that they are not superior and their ending is in Jahannam Imam Shafi and Imam Malik say that when a person is in combat and if it is possible for him to pray using signals then he will pray using signals and then he will make up his prayer afterwards and this prayer can be done on horseback it can be done whilst walking as well as has been done in Surah Al-Baqarah okay 
Imam Abu Hanifa says that during the actual combat, the person will not pray even with signals. And when the battle dies down, it is night time, they are not fighting, then you will make up the prayers that you have missed. In addition, that when an army goes out, they are in effect travelers. Okay, so they will do qasr. If their leader says, we are stopping here, it doesn't matter that he says we are stopping for 14 days or 15 days or 20 days. They will still do Qasr. Why? Because they are an army. They could move any time. For them to say we will stay here for 20 days, it's probably not going to happen. More likely, the next morning they'll be moving again. So they will continue to do Qasr. So in this form, when the person is making up his prayers, he will also make up what? Qasr prayers as well. All of this is to show the importance of the prayer. That the fuqaha are saying there is no way you can leave the prayer. It has to be prayed. So because this is so important, Allah followed up this ayah with the next ayah and said, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةَ That if you have completed the prayer, فَذْكُرُوا Allah, Then remember Allah. What kind of remembrance is this? Abdullah bin Abbas came inside the masjid and he saw some people doing dhikr, sitting down and lying down. So he asked them, what are you doing? They said, oh Allah said here, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا He said, no, this is with regards to the prayer of khawf, the prayer of fear. That if you finish the prayer of fear and you are guarding, then remember Allah. Because re the remembrance of Allah is the thing that will lead to your victory. Don't be forgetful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though you are in the middle of war. In <coughs> fact, it is doing war where the person will remember Allah more than he'll remember any other time. Because there's a possibility he might die. He's about to meet the enemy. So he'll be remembering Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing them. Because you have prayed a modified prayer, not a complete prayer, <coughs> then because of this, remember Allah. When do you remember Allah? Qiyaman wa qu'udan. The Prophet I'll, I'll come to question and answer in a second. Sorry? It's 8 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock. I'm just going to complete this ayah and then we'll, we'll finish. فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا wa qu'udan. The Prophet Sallam mentioned to Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu anhu when he was going to Yemen that, O oh, Mu'adh, do not leave, leave any minute, any moment go by except that your tongue is in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this dhikr is very important for that a person does at all times. You are driving in the car, instead of listening to podcasts on the radio and whatever else, you do dhikr. If a person has memorized the Qur'an, he memorizes the, he recites what he knows from his memory. I said this to one brother, he said, why don't you recite when you are driving the car? He said that either I will concentrate on the road or I will <laughs> recite the Quran and crash. I said, okay, uh, some people are able to do it, some people are not able to do it. You are commuting in the train, going to university, going to school, sitting down, rather than going on Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram, do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're going from your desk to get your coffee, 10.30, getting your muffin, whatever else, do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you are walking. Therefore, then a person, his tongue is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every moment. You're doing your work in the building site or whatever else as you are working. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. The person's tongue is in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubikum. Abdullah bin Abbas said that also, that one of the tafsir of the ayah is that if a person is unable to pray standing, just like we did last week, he's unable to pray standing, then he can pray sitting. If he is unable to pray sitting, then he will pray on his side. And we described this in the fiqh class last week. 
if you had aman now, you are no longer fighting, you're not in the middle of a fight, you come back to your homes, you are in the peaceful situation, فَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Meaning, pray the prayer in its complete form. Okay? Number one. Number two, أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ comes from the word qama. And we learn from this is that the qiyam in the prayer is a rukun of the prayer. Without it, if a person is able to pray, the prayer is not valid. The Prophet ﷺ himself practically did pray sitting down for voluntary prayers. All the fuqaha say that for an obligatory prayer you must stand, for a voluntary prayer a person can sit down. But the reward is half of the standing prayer. If a person is sick and he is unable to stand, then he will pray sitting down and he will get the reward of the person who used to pray standing. If he, this person never prayed in his life and then he became sick and then he said, okay, now I'm going to do tawbah and then he starts praying and he's unable to stand and he prays sitting down, he will not get the reward of the standing person. Okay, you understood the difference? Why is this? Because when a person has done an action all his life and then he becomes sick, he's unable to do that action, he will still get rewarded even if he's able to do it. But this person never did his thing his whole life. He never prayed. So he will not get the reward for that. So they pray the prayer in its complete form. The prayer is fard on the believers in its time. We probably will do this next week because it will take time. This is the first evidence in the Qur'an that there are five prayers. Now you will ask me, where does it say five in this ayah? And we will do that next week, inshaAllah. Okay? Imam Abu Hanifa took this ayah as an evidence for why he states that there is no combining of the prayers. Okay? He says that the prayers are prayed in their times. Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal said that, yes, that is true. But if you take the prayer of Khawf, the Prophet ﷺ prayed it in a different form. So where there is a reason, then you move out from the Asl. Okay? So because the Prophet ﷺ prayed it during rain and he combined during travel, then their madhab is also strong from the basis of their opinion. We'll stop here and we'll take any questions. 103.